questions without notice. I give the call to the honourable member for Durack. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Did the minister mislead the parliament when she said, and I quote, I can tell you what the voice won't be giving advice on. It won't be giving advice on changing Australia Day. End of quote. Order. I give the call to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Can I thank the member for Durack for her question? It is not the policy of this government to change the date of Australia's Day. Many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have strong views about Australia Day, but it is the parliament that makes those decisions. And it is clear from the question that we are putting to the Australian people that the power of the Order. parliament will not change. The voice may give advice, but the parliament retains its primacy. The parliament will make laws. Subsection 3 lays this out clearly, and it would do well for people to listen to this. The parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have the power to make laws with respect to matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, vo Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. This is, a, this is not about culture wars. This is about closing the gap. This isn't about division. This is about bringing people together. This isn't about tokenism. It's about making a practical difference. The minister has concluded her answer. I give the call to the member for Chisholm. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What are people in the housing sector saying to the government about the Housing Australia Future Fund, and why has the bill failed to pass? Yeah, good question. I give a call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member Order. for Chisholm for her question, and she was there, of course, in Melbourne on Saturday when we announced a $2 billion additional investment in social housing. New money for new homes. It comes on top of the other initiatives that we have taken. But there has one, one initiative, the Housing Australia Future Fund, a $10 billion fund that will build 30,000 new social and affordable homes Order. that has Member been blocked, blocked in the Senate. It's supported by housing and homelessness organisations across the board. But the Greens political party have formed an unholy alliance with the coalition to block it in the Senate. A coalition of the unwilling, Order. Mr Speaker. This is what the St Vincent de Paul Society said yesterday. This will further delay solutions to Australia's social and affordable housing crisis. After a decade of neglect, the society is urging the government, coalition, minor parties and independents to support the establishment of the HAP as a priority. Now, for the coalition, they've never supported social housing, and they say no to everything in this parliament. The member for but Deacon. for the Greens political party, this isn't about the Australian people. This is about them. They want the issue, not the outcome. They deal in protests. We focus on progress. And and you don't have to uh, you don't have to think that that's the case because the member for Griffith has carefully and the clearly said the quiet Deacon bit in objection. an article that's been written in the Jacobin magazine. This is what he had to say. He wrote, this parliamentary conflict helps create the space for a broader campaign in civil society. He went on to say this, we're opposing 30,000 social and affordable homes because, and I quote, allowing the HAP to pass would demobilise the growing section of civil society that is justifiably angry about the degree of poverty and financial stress that exists in such a wealthy country. So they're opposing it because it would demobilise people from campaigning against poverty. They want people to stay in poverty so they can have a rally against it. You can imagine. And they went on even further. They want to keep people down. He said this. While Parliament has debated the HAP, the Greens have also launched a national door-knocking campaign targeted 
and Labor held federal electorates. They want to knock on doors. We Order. want to build them homes with doors. That's the difference. It's all about the campaign, Order. not about the substance, and it is exposed by that. That's concluded. There is far too much noise on my right. The member for Griffith is warned. Give a call to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, will the Australian Labor Party accept Greens' preferences at the next election? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Member for Jelly Brand. Order. The, the House will come to order. Both members on my right and left are very exercised on this topic. Order. Order. There is far too much noise. The member for McEwen. When the House comes to order, order the member for Gippsland. It's the second question. It's far too much. Oh. Well, the member for uh, one and needs to listen. Order the Prime Minister has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And I really do thank the Leader of the Opposition for this question. The Leader of the Opposition, who relies upon One Nation preferences. Order. Who goes out there and defends Clive Palmer and all these far-right groups, far-right groups asking a question about where preferences go? A bit Order. sensitive, are we, Pete? The Prime Minister will pause. Order. Order. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy is not helping. The member for Fremantle. The Leader of the Opposition on point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, again, uh, and to, to help the House uh, on relevance, the Labor Party also accepts preferences from order, One Nation and Clive Palmer. That's an abuse of the standing order. Order. The, the Leader of the Opposition has asked his question. The Prime Minister is going to be heard in silence. Often part of a coalition of cookers there in Queensland. <laughs> They're all there. One nation, one farmer. One nation. The <laughs> order. The Prime Minister. Prime Minister will pause. Order. 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 The House will come to order. I agree with the leader of the opposition on that point. Order. I want to hear. Order. I want to hear from the member. For, order. Everyone's got to settle down. I mean it. I want to hear from the member for Fisher. Speaker, the prime minister used that unparliamentary term yesterday. You asked him to withdraw that term. He should be asked Look, to withdraw it again. Order. I can't. Order. I can't hear what the prime minister is saying. That's going to assist me greatly if the House will come to order so I can hear. cannot hear a word that he is saying. Everyone's had their fun. I'm going to call the Prime Minister back to order and to answer the question. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Thanks very much. Uh, during the... Oh. We've already done it. Order. Order. Resume your, resume your seat. Resume your seat. I didn't hear what the Prime Minister had said. And I'm trying to make the point. Resume your seat. I will, I will make decisions if things are unparliamentary or if members find things unparliamentary. Do you find the term that the Prime Minister used unparliamentary? Well, I'm just going to ask the Prime Minister to withdraw and to move on with this order. The Prime Minister can withdraw and just to, to keep moving. I, I withdraw and I note that they find it offensive that I mentioned Clive Palmer and One Nation and the association with the Queensland LNP. Order. But they're prepared, they're prepared to back up Clive Palmer in court cases against Mark McGowan's government. Against Mark McGowan's government. And I Order. Must, 
the I, leader of the I opposition. I must, Mr. Speaker, about political parties. Well, on the weekend there were two party conferences. There was one in Victoria where we were announcing $2 billion for social housing. But there was another political party conference held right here in, Qu right here in Canberra, Mr. Speaker. At the Federal Liberal Council, it was a different story. They weren't talking about they weren't talking about issues. There were no policy initiatives. It's still a policy void opposite. But there was a real treat. There was a seven and a half minute video titled The Peter Dutton I Know. <laughs> seven and a half minutes, Mr. Speaker. But I assure you it seems like longer. It seems like a full length feature movie. And, it, and, and in it, what those opposite don't seem to get is that we do know this bloke, and Australians do know this bloke. They know he said no to Order. help with their power bills. They know Order. he said no to secure jobs and better pay. They know he said no to cheaper medicine. They know he said no to jobs and manufacturing. Order. They know he said no to the national apology, and now he's saying no to constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. We, we know that he went, the forward. Of the we know the that he of the went forward with a budget reply and still hasn't produced, still hasn't produced any costings for that budget reply. No ideas, no policies, no solutions, just no, no, no to everything. And Australians will reject the negative approach of this negative opposition leader who's taken the word opposition a bit too literally. It is possible for you to support something constructive just once. It's been more than a year. We'll, we'll continue to wait. The member for Petrie. House of Common Daughters can hear the member for Hawke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. How will the Albanese Labor government's Housing Australia Future Fund help tackle the country's housing challenges? What is the cost of blocking its establishment? The call to the Minister for Small Business, the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for, Hawke for that question. I know that he, like me, wants to see more Australians in a safe, affordable place to call home. He's also been a big supporter of our ambitious and broad housing agenda, uh, particularly in his own electorate. And Mr the Speaker, order, our the, housing the agenda minister will is pause. ambitious. The minister will pause. The member for Deakin is continually interjecting. He's warned. He will not interject anymore. The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're investing more than $9.5 billion in housing and homelessness in just this financial year. $9.5 billion in just one year, because we are taking this so seriously. And part, of course, of our ambitious plan is the Housing Australia Future Fund, a $10 billion fund that will deliver 30,000 desperately needed social and affordable rental homes in the first five years of the fund. And it will also provide the certainty that organisations working on the front line have asked for. They're in perpetuity, half a billion dollars each and every year, Mr Speaker. And these groups were in Canberra this week. Indeed, they were there on Monday when the Greens moved a suspension in the Senate to block the Housing Australia Future Fund. And they were supported by the Liberal and National Senators, Mr Speaker. But there is a cost to this blocking, Mr Speaker, even though some have been saying there is no cost. Let me be clear. This is from the people who are on the front line. Power Housing Australia, who said the delay until October could mean approvals for 8,000 social and affordable homes would be delayed. Blue Chip, who said his staff had spent the last 18 months preparing 3,000 properties to start construction as soon as the bill had passed. And I quote, this may not happen now, Mr Speaker. The master builders who said the opposition and the Greens need to come to the party on this one. We need houses and our industry needs jobs to do, Mr Speaker. That's from the master builders. And the New South Wales Member, Housing Member Minister who said Farrah. the work that we are doing 
the work that everyone who is interested in actually delivering housing under these processes was doing is now paused. Mr. Speaker. There are very serious costs to blocking this bill in the Senate. Mr. Speaker. Decisions taken by the Greens, by the Liberals and the Nationals are having real consequences for these organisations on the ground, but importantly for the people that they are supporting each and every day. These are people that need homes. Every day of delay past 1 July is $1.3 million that will not be spent on housing. But, Mr Speaker, why they're blocking, we'll get on building. Why they're about delays, we're about delivery. And why they're about protest, we're about practical action that will help people, because we won't forget about the people on the ground. Give the call to the member for Clark. Speaker, my question is to the Resources Minister. Minister, these documents contain additional evidence of coal quality fraud by three companies regarding Australian exports to South Korea. Now, when I first raised this issue with you last year, the ACCC initially told me it would investigate. But since then, no agency has contacted me. The whistleblower involved struggled to even get a meeting with the ACCC, and only Terracom is being investigated. Minister, is your government trying to cover up these obvious coal crimes? The call to the Minister for Resources and the Minister for Northern Australia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Clark for his question. And I can assure you uh, this government is not interested in covering up anything at all, at least of all accusations such as this. Uh, I also want to thank the member for Clark for his advocacy for whistleblowers across Australia. Uh, and I admire him for his strong sense of social justice. And I thank you for him for his uh, tireless work in protecting our nation against corruption and misinformation. Uh, our, my office has engaged with the, the member on not perhaps the, the, the matter you are raising today, but on other matters in relation to uh, alleged misconduct in coal quality testing. I can assure the member I do take these allegations very seriously. I will have to look into the new matters you mentioned uh, in relation that you have raised uh, and your involvement or otherwise or lack of involvement as you have said in relation to the ACCC and of course I will do that and my office will undertake to do that uh, straight away. Uh, it is a serious matter. Uh, the allegations uh, there are allegations of coal quality testing uh, uh, misconduct and they are being looked into and we will make sure that all of these uh, are looked into as they should properly be. What I would say uh, is that anyone with information on this should go forward to the ACCC. It sounds like from what the member has said that that has happened and they might not have had the response uh, they uh, need to have, but I will make sure, I, and I'll speak with the Treasurer of course, uh, about undertaking to ensure that a response and a fulsome response is given because it's very serious and we, uh, the export of coal is very important to this country's economy, especially to that of the eastern seaboard, and it will continue to be uh, a provider of uh, energy security for our trading partners. And so we do need to have a confidence that the testing of that coal is undertaken in, in a proper manner. The uh, member for Clark. Uh, speaker, I seek leave to table the documents I refer to in my question. His leave granted. Um, speaker, leave's not granted, and I don't know what the legal consequences are of, of a ta tabling documents of that nature uh, with respect to the investigations. But um, I think the minister's answer directs to the, the other issues that will be dealt with. The call to the member for Aston. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. How is the Albanese Labor government getting on with the job of building the homes our people and our economy need? And what is blocking further progress? Great Give a call to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Another excellent question from the member for Aston, which gives me the opportunity to add to uh, the answer that the Housing Minister gave a moment ago as well. Uh, a defining feature of this PM and his government is to try and bring people together to address the big challenges in our economy and in our society which have been neglected for too long. And not because we expect some kind of unanimity around issues, but because we want to draw on the best pragmatic, problem-solving and collaborative instincts of the Australian people to try and create more opportunities in more communities. And that's the approach that guided the $2 billion social housing accelerator that we announced on the weekend, which will build thousands of new homes for the people who need them the most. 
and it's the same approach that I'll be taking to a meeting with state and territory treasurers on Friday to advance the housing accord which brings together governments, investors and industry. Uh, this is a really important part, Mr Speaker, of our broad, ambitious housing agenda, but it's not the only part of it. Now, as the Housing Minister said a moment ago, we are Member investing Casey, we'll nine and a half billion dollars in housing in this year alone, our first year in office. And in just two budgets, Mr Speaker, in just two budgets, we've made room for an extra $6.9 billion to fund more social and affordable housing and the biggest increase in Commonwealth rent assistance in three decades. Now, not since the member for Sydney was the housing minister have we seen this kind of investment in housing. In her case, about $6 billion, including 21,600 new homes for social housing. I pay tribute to her for that. Now, those investments then and these investments now show how serious we are about working with the sector and working with the states to build more homes for the people who need them in our communities. Now, unlike the Liberals and the Nationals, Mr Speaker, who always say no to more social housing, and unlike the Greens who say, yeah, but nah, yeah, but nah, they say they believe in social housing, they're just not prepared to vote for it when it really matters. They say they want more social housing and they go into the Senate and they vote against more social housing. Now, this government, Mr Speaker, and our budgets, they aren't just defined by our Labor values, they're defined by Australian values, working together to get things done for each other, putting pragmatism and problem solving ahead of posturing and product <laughs> differentiation, not just issuing pithy press releases, Order. but running this country and our economy in the interests of the people and communities who send us here to work for them. And what the Liberals and Nationals and the Greens have shown in the last week in the Senate in particular is that they have no idea what that means and no idea why that matters. Yeah. Give the call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Would the voice have the power to advise the government to abolish Australia Day? Order. The member for Lyons and the member for Cooper will cease interjecting. Order. The Minister for the Environment. The member for Barker won't interject. Give the call to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The voice will not be bothered by culture wars. It will focus on practical Order. On, a, on the practical different differences in terms of closing the gap. It will, as the second reading speech of the Attorney General made clear, it will focus on matters specific to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or matters that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people differently. And the key word there is differently. The word differently talks about things like the 10-year gap in life expectancy. It talks about the chance that our young people are incarcerated, uh, are more incarcerated than possibly going to university. It talks about infant and maternal mortality. It talks about children born at lower birth weights, higher rates of family violence, lower rates of finishing school and higher rates of unemployment, overcrowding in houses. It will not be involved in culture wars. Yeah. Has the oh, the minister concluded her answer. Before I call the member for Solomon, I'm pleased to inform the House that present in the gallery today are representatives from MND Australia who support people impacted by motor neuron disease. On behalf of the House, and I know the member for Mitchell, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. Give the call to the member for Solomon. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and Water. How is the Albanese Labor government protecting Australia's threatened species while also easing housing pressures at the same time? And are there any obstacles to these efforts? Give the call to the Minister for the Environment and Water. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Solomon. He is such a great local member because 
He's all over the environmental issues in his seat, but he also supports the building of much needed extra housing. Mr Speaker, last week I made an announcement about a housing, uh, a housing estate in Darwin. This was a project that began a few years ago in 2019, but recently there were some rare birds found on the site, the Gouldian finches, absolutely beautiful birds. And so, Mr Speaker, I paused that project, I paused the construction on that project to make sure that we could protect those birds. And that's what we've done. The birds are present around a dam on the site. We've protected the dam. We've protected a 50-metre buffer around the dam. We've got rid of, we're getting rid of the gamber grass, which is a terrible invasive species in the Northern Territory, replacing it with native grasses for the birds to nest in and feed in. We've also protected a stretch along the coast where we've got migratory uh, shorebirds. We're stopping people walking through their nesting areas as they were previously doing. All in all, we'll add 34 hectares of nature reserve to this area, which is about 18 SCGs. At the same time as protecting the birds, we'll see 800 new homes built, a new school, a new childcare centre, new community facilities, a new bike path. And I'll tell you what, in a city with a 1 per cent rental vacancy rates, where one in every and the Northern Territory where one in every 20 people are homeless, yeah. this much needed housing will make a the real Deputy contribution. The, um, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is interjecting again. I know it's not Gold Coast housing, but Darwin housing is important too. Now, I'll tell you, Mr Speaker, who is opposed to this. I'll, I'll tell you who is opposed to it. The Greens political party are opposed Order. to it. At least they are consistent. They're opposed to defence housing in Darwin. They're opposed to social housing in Sydney and in Order. Melbourne. They're opposed, to, uh, they're opposed to a $10 billion fund to the build more social housing, 30,000 new homes. Doesn't matter who the housing's for, whether it's women and children escaping domestic violence, whether it's veterans, whether it's defence personnel, whether it's private renters, whether it's public housing. If it's got four walls and a roof and a front door, they're again it. I'll tell you what, Mr Speaker, the difference is we on this side know that we need extra housing, we need to put roofs over the uh, heads of Australians, and we can better protect the environment at the same time. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Flinders. My question is for the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Can the Minister name an issue that affects non-Indigenous Australians that does not affect Indigenous Australians? O order. I'm just going to ask the member to I couldn't hear the question, and I just want to make sure it's in order. It's just the minister will pause a moment. The question is, can the minister name an issue that affects non-Indigenous Australians that does not affect Indigenous Australians? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I'll, hear, I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, there is no reference in the question to the responsibilities of the minister. No. Not one. It's not like a rephrasing or anything. It is simply not there. There's no attempt to be there. Yeah. Yeah. It would assist the house if the, the question could reflect on a policy or an an, an, an issue is so broad. Um, I'm just going to hear from the uh, manager of opposition business. Well. Mr Speaker, with respect, I don't think there can be any doubt that this question refers to the voice, which is the subject that this topic, this parliament has been engaged with over repeated days, and we have heard this minister assert this point on a number of occasions. Well, uh, the, the question didn't contain the word the voice, but order. You can find a way through this. Order. Just I'll hear from the leader of the house, Mr Speaker. Uh, the question, with respect to what the member, manager of opposition business just said, questions are in order or out of order based on the words of the question, <laughs> not based on the vibe in the mind of the manager of opposition business. Order. 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 
The Minister for Social Services will cease interjecting. Members on my left will cease interjecting. Order. The Minister for Industry is not helping. The Minister for Industry will cease interjecting immediately. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to make a contribution uh, following on from the Leader of the House's contribution, but I presume surely that you're in a position to rule this question in order. There is no ambiguity whatsoever about the question being in order. It is within the scope of the Minister's portfolio, with or without reference to the voice, and it cannot be ruled out of order on any basis uh, relating to the wording of the question. Oh. Rubbish. Rubbish. Order. Order. The question was regarding an issue that affects non-Indigenous Australians that does, not, that does not affect Indigenous Australians. So I'm going to allow the question, but order. It is, by any definition, a very broad question. And I give the Minister for Indigenous Australians the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Oh, the uh, member for Lengiari is warned. As I have said already, the voice will not be required to make a representation on every law, policy and program. The Attorney-General made, made clear that matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people means matters specific to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or matters which affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people differently. Just look at the bottom score of every social rung of every social ladder in this country and you might figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Order. Give the call. The Minister for Skills will cease interjecting. Give the call to the member for Blair. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering on this defence strategic review for Northern Australia and cleaning up the mess of the last decade left by the former government? Give the call to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence. Well, can I thank the member for his question and the acknowledge for, his the, ongoing the interest and the in, for Herbert. in the defence of Australia? Uh, today, there are almost 2,000 US Marines in Darwin operating alongside our troops as part of the 12th Marine rotation, which commenced with a decision of the Gillard government back in 2011. And this activity represents an increased focus on the part of our Defence Force on our nation's north, as is the $3.8 billion commitment over the next four years by the Albanese government to increase the utility of our northern bases for our Defence Force. This represents one of the six key priorities that the government is focused on in response to the Defence Strategic Review. And it comes after a decade of inaction from the former government when it came to our northern bases. It was the 2012 Force Posture Review which said how important our northern bases are to our nation's defence. And this was reaffirmed in the 2013 Defence White Paper. But in the decade which ensued, when those opposite were governing our country, the Defence Strategic Review found precious little was done to increase the capability of our northern bases. But the failure of those opposite to act on our northern bases really shouldn't come as much of a surprise because the Defence Strategic Review also found that the former coalition government effectively cut billions of dollars from the defence budget. In their last five years in government, $20 billion worth of effective defence cuts, including billions of dollars stripped out of our defence force through a single strategic reserve adjustment. Now, the former government's effective cuts to defence, their failure to invest in our northern bases, the capability gap that they opened up in respect of our submarines as a result of a decade of indecision together represents a monumental failure on their part in respect of the defence of the Australian people. 
And that could not have come at a worse time for our country, as Australia faces the most complex and threatening strategic circumstances that we've had since the end of the Second World War. Well, Mr Speaker, all of that is now changing. Under the Albanese government, we are bringing the defence budget back into order. We are focusing our resources where defence needs it the most, based on a new posture, which includes focusing on our northern bases. These are serious decisions being made by a serious government committed to keeping Australians safe. Yeah. Give the call to the honourable member for Cowper. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. The Voice Referendum Working Group Order. member and Yes 23 Director Thomas Mayo has stated, we keep going, we maintain this momentum until we change the system, until we tear down the institutions. On what basis did the Minister appoint Mr Mayo to the Referendum Working Group? Order. Order. Members on my right. Give the call to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. I have a responsibility, and that responsibility is what I say. Give the call to the order. Give the call to the member for Adelaide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Industry and Science. How is the Albanese Labor government changing previous approaches to revitalise manufacturing, sharpen Australia's technology edge and deliver skilled, high-paid jobs? I give the call to the Minister for Industry and Science. Zero week. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member for Hindmarsh for that question because he knows ours is a government that wants to deliver a future made in Australia. Our people possess in spades the know-how to get stuff done in tough circumstances and they can show the rest of the world how to get that done too. And I was reminded of that potential this week, meeting the cohort of students that are off to compete in the International Science Olympiad, the, uh, the others that are about to uh, get involved or have been involved in the National Youth STEM Summit, as well as the first ever intake of Indigenous science grads at the CSIRO that the member for Canberra and I visited today at Black Mountain. Now, these students, recent graduates, they're going to be the researchers, the scientists, the skilled workers and future industry leaders. And we can put that enormous talent to work if we rebuild manufacturing and open up economic opportunity through the things we are doing as a government today. So we know there is a lot to do. We're not wasting any time in revitalising Australian manufacturing and sharpening the nation's technology edge. That's why setting up the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund matters. That's why the $392 million industry growth program announced in the budget matters. That's why putting together plans for tech, like the National Quantum Strategy to drive future growth and support industry, that matters. That's why uh, making headway towards our goal of 1.2 million Australians in tech-related jobs matters. Uh, and that's why also refreshing our national science priorities to help guide our scientists and researchers matters. Now, we've mined and farmed our way to a lot of money, but the next chapter in future growth uh, is going to focus on the value add. It's about us doing more with what we've got and doing more of it on shore. But what we're not about is chasing manufacturers out of the country like that mob did driving out jobs, pressuring communities. It's not about putting together suddenly Order. a manufacturing grants Order. program Member that gets Gibson. spent in the weeks leading into an election like the Liberal and National parties did. And you'd think, after a decade of chaos and neglect, Speaker, that they would have learnt their lessons, but the Liberal Order. and National parties have not. Look at their track record the in opposition. The Liberal we'll and National parties refused to back the National Reconstruction Fund to help manufacturers. They refused to, back in lower, uh, refused to back in lower energy prices to help manufacturers. They refused to back better wages for low-paid blue-collar workers. The only time the Liberal and National parties ever want to talk about manufacturing is if there's a TV camera present or a lame social media meme to be made. We deserve better than that, and that is what the Order. government is the absolutely time delivering. Has concluded.
Give the call to the honourable member for Ryan. Question to the Prime Minister. You and I and many others in this place benefited from free university before fees were introduced by the Hook Labor government. Last night, the University of Melbourne Vice-Chancellor called for first degrees to be free, something the Greens have also been calling for. Prime Minister, will you commit to making university free, or is Labor content with students continuing to accumulate massive rising debts? Give the call to the Minister for Education. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. No, we don't support that because what that would mean is that fewer people go to university, not more. In fact, that would mean that just a lucky few would end up going to university. And the sort of people that would miss out would be people from poorer backgrounds and people from the bush and more Indigenous Australians. You know, Mr. Speaker, Kermit the Frog was wrong. It is easy being green because you can promise the world and you don't have to Order. deliver anything. You can pretend that you care about homelessness, but you can vote against putting a roof over their head. And here on this side of the parliament, we want more homeless people to have a roof over their head, and we want more Australians to get the chance to go to university. And that's what the accord will be all about. Give the call to the member for Jagger Jagger. Order. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Skills and Training. How is the Albanese Labor government supporting apprentices and encouraging more women into trades? To call to the Minister for Skills and Training. Well, can I thank firstly the, the member for Jagger Jagger for her question? It wasn't long ago that we were at uh, Melbourne Polytechnic meeting uh, apprentices and teachers and talking about the skills that we need to deliver to the economy to nation-building projects, it's really absolutely critical. And whilst the Albanese government is investing record dollars in apprenticeships, there's no doubt uh, we need to make sure that there's not just enrolments but completions. The problem is we see too few completions, and in fact, there's been a de decline in trade apprenticeships being completed over the last decade. In 2012, 57,000 trade apprenticeships were completed. In 2021, it fell by more than 20,000. So over that decade, we've seen a decline in trade apprenticeships. So too with the failure to ensure a greater participation of women in traditional trades. At 8 per cent, when we compare ourselves with countries, often that we do compare ourselves against, 8 per cent is a very low number for women in traditional trades. We must do much better than that. Now, the Albanese government, of course, has introduced the Australian Skills Guarantee that ensures that on Commonwealth-funded projects we have at least one in every ten workers being an apprentice, but we've also now set goals to double the proportion of women in Commonwealth funding projects as well. That's, that's projects over $10 million, Senator because we need to see a greater level of participation. Now, even though there are too few women in traditional trades. I recently was in the member for Cooper's electorate, the Assistant Minister for Health. With the Assistant Minister, we were at Freedon, a company that employs female electrician apprentices. and We spoke to Georgia and she said to us that she was very happy to be an electrician, secure work, great pay, and she wanted to ensure that women followed her. And She said, just back yourself. Well, that's a fantastic sentiment. Back yourself, but the Albanese government will back you too with non-financial and financial support to ensure that women complete apprenticeships in the traditional trades, and indeed will ensure it by removing cost barriers. And the fee-free TAFE proposal, the initiative that we've set in train now for a, a year, has ensured that we've removed cost barriers for women apprentices to go into building and construction, for example, which is absolutely vital. Uh, and absolutely vital, and indeed we continue to see more of that. Uh, and so, well done, Georgia, for really make, sending that message out. Because what a role model she, she is, and others are. But industry must also lead. I mean, what sort of business model in 2023 is that we hive off half the working population uh, in terms of uh, who should be applying for certain jobs? That is not a good approach by industry. We need to ensure that women have opportunities in what have been male-dominated occupations. Call to the honourable member for Capricornia. Thank you, Dep uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. 
Minister, Order. would the voice have the power to provide advice to the government on any program within the budget? Give a call to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the question, uh, the uh, member for the question? I have made the point repeatedly this week that the voice has no power of veto. So the answer to your question is obvious. I am not sure what the uh, opposition is missing. Exactly. This is a practical Order. and Order. simple proposition. This is about making practical change to the lives of First Nations people in this country. And it is also about uniting this country and recognising 65,000 years of history. There are 10 design principles, and that is the end of my answer. Order. order. Members on my left. The order, when the House comes to order, order, members on my left. I'll and the Minister for Child Care will cease interjecting, so I can hear from the member for Benelong. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How will constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through a voice improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and why is it important that people avoid false campaigns designed to create fear? Order. Order. The question was heard in silence. The Prime Minister. Will be heard I thank the support. member for his question. Let's cut to the essence of what is within our reach. Yep. Two things. Constitutional recognition of the fact that this continent that we share with the oldest continuous culture on earth that's been here for 65,000 years. And the form of that constitutional recognition that they have asked for through a First Nations constitutional convention held at Uluru in 2017 is through a voice. The voice will give us the best practical means that we have ever had to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And Australians get it because Australians value fairness above politics. Australians value solutions above games. And Australians have the sense to look past the fear-mongering of some. Earlier this year, the Leader of the Opposition apologised for boycotting the apology to the stolen generations. And yet what we've Order. had is a return to the same playbook. In January 2008, the Leader of the Opposition said this, I think the Australian people deserve to know the full details of the implications of this policy, including the financial ones. It would beg a belief that they would be contemplating an apology that could open the government up to serious damage claims without knowing what those claims would be. At a time when there are stresses on the economy, we need to know fully the impact of all government decisions. He predicted $10 billion in compensation claims if the apology were made. It was nonsense then and it's nonsense now. The apology was an important step in Australia's journey of healing and reconciliation. And I urge everyone to return to the words that came to us from the very the centre of the, of the continent in the Uluru Statement. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. I urge people to look at the words that are being put forward that make it clear the primacy of the parliament. I urge people to have a look at the second reading speech of the Attorney-General that has legal consequences, speaking about matters that affect Indigenous Australians differently. And I urge people as well, those opposite, to listen to the words of the person that this Leader of the Opposition appointed as Shadow Attorney-General. The voice is advisory. It won't be Moses handing down the tablets from the mountain. The parliament will still be the democratic centre of our national life. The parliament will still be supreme Order. in matter of policy and law. The yeah. member for Barara continues to be a powerful advocate for the constitutional change. I say to all Australians, parliaments pass laws, but it's people that make history, and we have an opportunity to advance reconciliation in the Order. last quarter of this year. I sincerely hope and call for Australians to vote yes. Yeah. Give a call to the 
call to the member for Kennedy. PM, could you confirm that house prices in Brisbane and Sydney exceed 800,000? And since only a million people live outside the 70 kilometre east coast, Perth and Victoria, who'd miss Victoria? PM, if migration is halved and your housing authority buys or designates 14,000 one hectare housing blocks, Charters Towers, Ingham, Air, Mariba, Atherton, and if the authority overrides what the Reserve Bank describes as insurmountable building, planning, zoning impositions, won't we get house and land packages in paradise for under 280,000? There was a question at the front end of the question, sort of. Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Kennedy for his question. I thank him for his ongoing interest in delivering more homes for people who live in regional Queensland. I, I note he will be chairing for Queensland tonight, and uh, I note also that this is one of the three nights of the year where the member for Kennedy and I might have some differences there. But I also thank the member for his support of the Housing Australia Future Fund. And he's quite right. One of the things that we need to have a look at is decentralisation in this country. And there is enormous potential for growth in places like the paradise that the member for Kennedy has shown me around over the years, whether it's Curry, Mount Isa that I'll visit with the member for Kennedy in a couple of months' time, uh, whether it be Julia Creek, uh, whether it be uh, the other wonderful parts uh, of the member for Kennedy's electorate. Because I know that uh, the member understands that indeed if we look at affordability, part of what we have to do is to look at decentralisation and growth uh, in regional Australia where people want, uh, are wanted, where there are jobs available, uh, where people can live with an extraordinary quality of life in those local communities that do have that real sense of community that comes with a, a smaller uh, regional town. Uh, this is why uh, I'm happy to work with the member for Kennedy in ensuring that when, uh, with Queensland, we look at where the investment will go of the increased social housing funding, we ensure that uh, a portion of that goes to regional Queensland, including in the member for Kennedy's electorate. Uh, it is why we announced a $2 billion social housing accelerator to deliver thousands of homes uh, on Saturday. It's why we made $575 million available for social and affordable rental homes by widening the remit of the NIFIC as one of our first acts when we came into government. It's why we're building, uh, through the National Housing Accord, a shared ambition to build one million homes. It's why uh, we are delivering, we are delivering as well, uh, increased support in build to rent uh, accommodation through the budget measures that the Treasurer announced on, on budget night. Uh, that anticipated to build something like between 150 and 250,000 additional homes. Uh, the fact is uh, that the member points towards uh, what needs to be a part of the strategy, a part of the strategy to take pressure off our big major cities, particularly along the east coast, but particularly to have growth in parts of regional Australia that are going to be a part of powering us into the future, Order. particularly uh, in the members' electorate. That's good. I give the call to the member for Bendigo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Twelve months ago, Australia's infrastructure investments were a mess of, war of waste, rorts and broken promises. How has the Albanese Labor government cleaned up the mess and delivering on its commitments, and what more is left to do? Order. Give the call. Order. I want to hear from the manager. Order. I want to hear from the manager of opposition business. Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, standing orders are very clear as to the matters about which a minister can be asked, uh, and speakers in the past have ruled questions in whole or in part out of order, uh, where the text refers to things that happened in this case before the minister became the minister. And I ask that you do that for this question. Order. 
want to hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, the the House. Uh, Mr the Speaker, the, the, the part that the manager of opposition business is objecting to is the part that sets the context of a question. And if, I don't think it's in the opposition's interest to be taking the concept out that you can set the context of a question, given that almost all of their questions do that. Uh, the question itself asks how the government has cleaned up the mess that it was just referred to and delivered on its commitments, which is clearly the job of the minister. This issue was dealt with last week. I'm just going to listen to the minister carefully. This is not an excuse. The minister knows that she cannot simply give an answer regarding the former minister. She's going to have to set some context, but the majority of her answer I'm going to listen to carefully to make sure it is within the standing orders. And I'll give her the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. They seem a little sensitive over on that side about these issues. Uh, I thank very much the member Order. for Bendigo for her question. Uh, she knows how important infrastructure investment is in her electorate. Order. It's why she is such a strong advocate for projects like the Bendigo Airport upgrade and supporting Order. making Member sure Page. we've got strong rail manufacturing here in Australia. Well, of course, just over 12 months Order. ago, our government inherited an infrastructure investment portfolio that was chock full of waste, of rorts and undelivered promises. Uh, under those opposite, Australians suffered through a wasted decade Order. that saw many communities uh, miss out on investments that they warned. needed. Over the last 12 months, we've had a lot of work to do to repair this, the damage, repair that damage and put Australian Order. infrastructure back the on the a sustainable footing. And I'm very happy to report that that job is well underway. We're getting inland rail back on track. The first deal for flights to operate out of Western Sydney International Airport have been secured, with the airport uh, having a milestone recently that the Prime Minister and I visited of the airport itself is 50 per cent complete. We've created new trusted and fair grants program for every community, from the city Order. to the bush. We're returning Infrastructure Australia to its rightful role as the Commonwealth's expert infrastructure advisor. We're delivering an aviation white paper. Order. We're partnering with Queensland to deliver the Brisbane Olympics. The and we're working the with the states and territories to clean up the infrastructure investment pipeline. We've established the High Speed Rail Authority, focusing first on the detailed case from Newcastle to Sydney. We're investing in the Cairns Marine Precinct. We're building the Rocky Ring Road and we're getting with, on with projects all along the Bruce Highway. We're listening to local communities and particularly bringing the Australian Council of Local Governments back here to Canberra and importantly investing a further $250 million to uh, fix our local roads. We're investing $2.2 in the suburban rail loop east. We're creating a maritime strategic fleet, introducing Australia's first fuel efficiency standard. We're revitalising the Musselbrook Town Centre, which will be opening very soon. We're sealing the Tanami in Western Australia and in the Northern Territory, and we're building a metro line to Order. Western Sydney. Working together, uh, we have done an awful lot, but the thing is with infrastructure investment, that job is never done. There's always another road to build, another rail line to upgrade, Order. another job creating opportunity raising project to invest in. Working cooperatively with our partners in the states and territories with a revitalised infrastructure Australia, we're going to keep investing in those projects all around the nation to deliver a better future for all Australians. Give the order. Give the call to the member for Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Minister, where in the wording proposed to create a new chapter in the Constitution is the voice restricted from offering advice to the government and the executive on any issue it chooses? Give the order. Give the call to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. The member for Spence is warned. The member for Barker has asked his question. He won't interject during this answer. And the Minister for Social Services and the Minister for the Environment are getting very close to being warned. The Minister for Indigenous Australians has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Barker for his question? And I'm sorry that uh, it appears that you aren't able to read the very simple instructions for what this is about. Clause 3 makes very clear. 
Order. Members on my right. Members on my right will cease interjecting. Order. The member for Kingsford Smith. The member for Spence will leave the chamber under 94A. The member for Barker on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the minister to withdraw. Whilst I did grow up in a household where language was not English was not my first language, I can read. I'll just ask the minister if she can assist the House. I'm very happy to assist the House, and I withdraw that comment. Uh, the, I have said on at least five or six occasions this week uh, what the voice is responsible for and what the second reading speech of the Attorney General said, particularly in relation to matters that affect Indigenous people differently. I think it is patently clear. But let me say this to the member for Barker. I have been to communities that are crying out for a different way of doing things. I have been the to communities the the where we'll there are objective. 30 people living in two bedroom homes. I have been to communities the where babies leader, are drinking we'll sweet cordial. I can't hear the minister. If the, minister, if the deputy interjects, she will be warned. I have been to communities where babies are drinking sweet cordial instead of water because it's cheaper. I have been to communities where you cannot get in and out because of the road conditions. I have taken a friend who died at 43 of end stone of end uh, end year Member for end of life renal failure to visit his son in jail i have seen friends die in hospitals because they are very young and their Member conditions in their life when they were young were terrible so do not tell me what I do or do not know about Aboriginal Australia, and do not tell me. Order. And Order. Do, and do not tell me that the proposition that the Prime Minister has outlined is not needed in this country. I am not interested in culture wars. I am interested in closing the gap. Yeah. 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 Order. Order. The call to the member for Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. How is the Albanese Labor government's investment in communications infrastructure helping fix connectivity issue challenges for Australians in rural and regional communities? Give the call order. Members will cease interjecting. Give the call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his questions. He knows that if you live in a capital city or in a region, access to fast, reliable, and affordable broadband has never been more important. And that's why the Albanese government is supporting the NBN to provide thousands of Australians living in rural and regional areas access to faster, unmetered SkyMuster <laughs> satellite broadband. Mr Speaker, this is a game changer for regional Australia. We know that Australians have never been more data hungry, with more devices consuming more data than ever before. And what this new product means is that satellite consumers can get faster downloads of up to 100 megabits per second, unmetered data, 24 hours a day. And that is a first for an NBN consumer satellite product. And Mr Speaker, these improved satellite services have been made possible by this government's $480 million upgrade to the fixed wireless network. Upgrades that the Liberals the and Nationals talked about but never actually delivered. In contrast, Mr Speaker, the Albanese government is delivering. There are over 400,000 homes and businesses that can now access faster internet speeds with this new satellite product. 
and they include more than 4,800 in the member for Hunter's own electorate. Yeah. The honourable member for O'Connor may be pleased to know that there's almost 29,000 premises in his electorate that can benefit from that. And in Maranoa, the honourable member may Order. be pleased to know that there's some 20,000 premises in his electorate which will enjoy those faster and more reliable internet speeds. And I know that the member for Indi, who has been a passionate advocate for improved connectivity, will be pleased to learn that there is some 11,500 premises alone in her electorate that can benefit from this. Mr Speaker, this product launch follows the successful trial of over 10,000 customers who reported greater user satisfaction with higher speeds and uncapped data. And what it does, Mr Speaker, is that it complements the commitments that we made in the October budget to deliver $1.1 billion for rural and regional communications infrastructure. And importantly, that includes $656 million to improve mobile and broadband connectivity, but in particular resilience, which is so important for rural and regional areas, with $65 million to communities in need to improve their disaster readiness. So, Mr Speaker, our work to fix the MBN to improve regional connectivity comes after nearly a decade of technological and economic incompetence by those opposite, whose multi-technology mix failed the regions, who promised an NBN for $29 billion. It doubled in cost Order. and didn't deliver. This government the is Minister's delivering. Time. And I call the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.